felt the Lord impress me that um, maybe I should share a few things. And one of the things that um, I've been learning from God lately is how to be a steward of, of God's reputation. You know, we often don't think of ourselves as stewards of God's reputation. We, um, we think that we're stewards of God's time, the money, you know, the resources he's given us, talents that he's given us. We're stewards of different things. But we don't realize that we are also stewards of God's reputation. In other words, we need to take care of how people look at us because that's how they're going to look at God, right? Amen. And I'm going to show you an example of, uh, whoops, <laughs> maybe I, maybe, yeah, I hope I don't keep, yeah. So <clears throat> this is an example of a bad steward. Now you get an idea what that looks like. No, this is Ryan, Ryan Locke. Uh, I, some of you might have heard of him before. Back in 2016, uh, he was one of the uh, Olympic um, champions in the, in the swimming competition. And I, I couldn't believe all the medals he won. I, uh, when I was researching him, I, he, he just, he, uh, he had a ton of gold. I, uh, it's just, it was amazing, it's something like 90 medals altogether, 50 gold, and anyway, he was pretty, he was pretty high up there. So because of, his, uh, because of his talents, he, he got sponsorships, okay? So he was sponsored by uh, Speedo, Ralph Lauren, um, Air Weave, Gentle Hair Remover, Removal, um, and these sponsorships, we're talking Boku Bucks here. I mean, somewhere like in the five to seven million dollars, okay? And he messed that up. He messed that up. He, he was, um, he told the policeman, this back in, in Rio, he told the police, um, I don't know, and I don't know all the details of the story, but um, somehow he and three other friends, they got really drunk one night, and, and he told the police, I'm not sure how the police got there, but he told the police that they were robbed, they were mugged, okay? And this was a total lie, when in actuality, what they were doing was they were, because they were in a drunken stupor, they were urinating all over this gas station. And I suspect that the manager of the gas station called the police and reported them as, um, you know, there, there's some people that are <laughs> urinating all over my gas station. And they made up this story, oh, we were, we were robbed. Uh, we, we were mugged. And, uh, well, the only problem was that there were surveillance cameras. <laughs> <laughs> and when they looked at the surveillance cameras, uh, they couldn't deny it. Okay, we weren't robbed, we were just urinating all over the gas station. And this caused a big, ruckus and controversy and all that. And you can imagine that the reputation that, that they um, portrayed for the companies that they sponsored, right? Immediately, um, Speedo, Ralph Lauren, Airweave, <laughs> Gentle Hair Removal, immediately they, they, pulled their, they pulled their sponsorship. So right away, they lost five to seven million dollars right there. But not only that, um, think of how they, how they disgraced America, right? I mean, here's, not only did they urinate on, on a gas, at a gas station, but they lied about it afterwards. And for a long time, they wouldn't, they wouldn't fess up. They, they said, no, we were robbed, and, and it became a big controversy. And then finally, somebody, finally, they, they, they looked at the surveillance cam uh, video and found that they were lying. Um, and so they were really, they, uh, Ryan Locke was a disgrace to himself, his country, his family, and to these companies. He was supposed to protect the reputation of these companies, not smear it. And as Christians, we have the same responsibility to protect God's reputation. We are stewards of God's reputation. Um, let's see if this works. 
So, okay. Um, as stewards of God's reputation, we represent God to the people we come in contact with every day. It's a little scary to think that we might be the only Jesus someone ever sees, you know. Um, and when we mess up, we not only dishonor ourselves, but most importantly, we dishonor God, especially people who know we're Christians. I hope somebody never says this about us. You know, if that's what it means to be a Christian, I don't want to have anything to do with them. That is embarrassing. If anybody ever says that about you, you know, pray. <laughs> um, you know, we are the hands and feet, and most importantly, the face of God to the world. Just like uh, Ryan Locke was the face of Speedo, and when he messed up, he, he messed up their reputation. And so when we mess up, we mess up God's reputation. And it's a heavy responsibility. Being a light, I like this verse. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. Okay, that's a heavy responsibility. Now, being a light to the world is not an option for us. It is essential for our spiritual growth. When Jesus gave us the Great Commission, he didn't do it to proclaim the good news to the world. I mean, that wasn't his only reason. He could have done that with angels, right? Have you ever wondered why did he do it? Why did he give that to us? Why not just get all his angels to proclaim the gospel, right? Because we are, we are the ones for two reasons. We're going to be the most effective because we know where humans come from, right? We can re they can relate to us. And then secondly, we need it. We need to be able to, uh, we need to witness as part of our own spiritual growth. I remember when I was in Japan uh, as a student missionary, that was when I grew the most spiritually. And it was because, for one thing, I had to teach Bible every day. Uh, and I've never done that before. And so that, that made me grow spiritually. But, you know, we don't all have to teach Bible to grow, to grow spiritually with God. Um, I also had the opportunity every day to witness to my students, not in a Bible class, but I knew they were watching me. Because I was the teacher, they were always watching everything I say, everything I do. We were always under the microscope, you know, and if we mess up, and they, they, they know that I'm a Christian, if we mess up, imagine what they would think about God. Oh, so that's how Christians are. So let's say I, let's say I went out and, uh, uh, and got drunk one night or something. You know, I mean, I, I've never, I, I, I don't drink, of course. But uh, let's say I went, and they would say, oh, okay, Christians get drunk. Well, let's say I get angry at somebody and, and just you know, start hollering at somebody. Oh, okay, Christians get angry at people. And so they're just like us. They're no different. Imagine the reputation of God that I would mess up, uh, in, that I could mess up in front of them. And so, um, but because I was on, in the spotlight every day, I think that's when I grew the most, because I felt the responsibility. Hey, these people are looking at me, and I'm representing God. I'm, I'm representing God's reputation. I'm taking care of God's reputation. And, and that helped me to grow the most. I really grew by, grew by leaps and bounds while I was in Japan. And then when I went back to La Sierra as a college student, my spiritual growth plummeted, right? I didn't have as much opportunity to witness or give Bible study. And um, so, and I think a lot of us as Christians, we fall into that same category of, uh, well, I, I do prayer, I do Bible study, I just don't do the witnessing part because there's no opportunity, right? And so. We can't grow like that. We need, we need all three. Um, and, and, and so we need, the third component is the witnessing um, our spiritual growth. Let me see if I can. Hmm. Oh, okay. Our greatest spiritual growth occurs when we work with God doing his work. And, and today, I want to share with you some ways that we do work with God that you may not have thought of. Like I said, it's not always about preaching 
giving Bible studies. Um, it's about how we live our lives. That's how we work with God. And uh, we work with God whenever he impresses us. Uh, it can happen anytime. You may, you may be in a store and all of a sudden God impresses you, hey, talk to that person or, or help that person or, or do something. We, that's how we work with God. Whenever we need to be in tune with God so that he can tell us what he wants us to do. Uh, and working with God is how we grow spiritually. Let me kind of illustrate this a little bit. <clears throat> Pastor... Um, Alvin had a, had a similar slide once. When we first become Christians, that's called justification. When through the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice, we ask God to, uh, we, we tell God that we surrender to him and we want to give our lives to him and then we, we're baptized, we're labor. Okay, this is the sanctuary. And then we move to the second phase of our spiritual growth, which is sanctification. Right? We're all looking forward to glorification, but we've got to make it through sanctification first. And sanctification involves three steps. The um, altar of incense represents prayer. The table of showbread represents Bible study. And then the candlelight represents doing God's work. We are a light to the world. Now, like I said, it, we do the prayer, we do the Bible study, but we don't do much of doing God's work. And that's where we don't grow as much, is because we're not working with God doing his work. And, and so today I want to share with you some examples of how we can work with God more um, doing his work. Um, and, these, and like I said, these are ways that, that you may not have thought of as, as actually working with God. I'm not talking about the preaching, teaching, and giving Bible studies, but just er things we do every day. Um, the light we share, most of the time, the light we share is just the life that we live and how we treat others. People are watching that. You'd be surprised how, how much people are watching us. Uh, in my work, sometimes I, I, they, they mention things about me, and I think, oh, how, how did you know that? Uh, <laughs> well, they were watching me. And I didn't know that. Um, so the, and it's easy to treat others with kindness um, when they're being nice to you. But Jesus gives us a, um, a greater command, a much harder command to keep, right? And that's this command. But I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. Now that's hard. Uh, if somebody's kind, kind to me, I can be kind to them. But when somebody spitefully uses you, it's a struggle, right? It's a struggle to be, to be kind to them. But why do you think, think for a moment, why do you think Jesus told us to love our enemies and do good to those who spitefully use us? Because this is God's strongest conversion tool that he can use. When, when we show kindness to people who least deserve it, this gives the Holy Spirit a strong tool to convert that person's heart. The proof is in my own experience and maybe hopefully in yours. So many times God has given me mercy, forgiveness, and blessings when, when I least deserve it. Right, and um, when I when I really failed him, when when I great and I know I greatly disappointed him, and when that happens, he blesses me, and I'm thinking, why did he do that? But when he does that, guess what happens? My heart melts with shame, and I <clears throat> I just want to surrender to him. God can do the same thing. The Holy Spirit can have the same impact on people when we show them undeserved kindness. And I want to share with you some stories that illustrate um, how undeserved kindness can melt the heart of people and bring about conversion. The first one, <clears throat> the soda pop truck. I'd just like to read, this is uh, by Don Bell, and it's a, it's a great story. Um, I never drank pop when I was a country kid living in Colorado back in the mid-20s. We were too poor. But every day, a truck 
filled with cases of bright orange and red pop would pass near my house on its route from Lennar to Wiley. I wanted to try that pop bad, and like most youngsters at, at around 12 or 13 who get a little mischievous, I had an idea. I waited on my horse, well hidden from the road, and when the truck passed by, I took off galloping alongside the truck and I pitched bottles uh, off the truck and into the high weeds. So you can see back then uh, how you can be galloping beside it and you just pull out some, some soda pop. And um, it, was, it was so easy the first day, I began to do it all the time. It was stealing, really, but <laughs> I didn't want to think about that. Um, I had never had cold pop before, so to me, the hot, sun-drenched pop was just fine. Well, one time, I drank too many bottles. I got ill and couldn't eat my supper. I knew my mother would give me a switching if she knew why, so I quit for a few days. Now, for you younger folks, like Elder Bush now, um, a, switching, <clears throat> a switching is a form of punishment before it became illegal. Um, I, I'm not talking about switching from one thing to another, okay? Um, so, but, but soon the old yearnings for hot pop came over me and I was back on my horse. And again, the truck went by and just like Jesse James, I came out of the weeds riding hard, only this time, the driver stopped and yelled, Sonny, get over here. I started to run, but suddenly, but I started to run, but stopped thinking, well, he might shoot me, because I had heard about fleeing robbers getting shot. So, uh, so I didn't run. And he walks up to me, and he says, uh, here, Sonny, I brought you a, a six pack of bottles, uh, ice cold pop. He said, that hot pop is no good for you. It can make you sick. <clears throat> that put an end to my pop-stealing career. But more than the cool taste of the pop, I knew that honest living was more important than frivolous satisfaction. I had been taught always to be my best, and once that driver showed me a kindness that I didn't deserve, I knew I was no longer my best. And, what that, had to, uh, and that had to change. It was a change that would serve me well. Dear God, please help me to show the sort of kindness that can lead other folks to better things like, like you. Now, I thought that was ingenious, the way this truck driver fixed the problem, right? Because he didn't want to just fix the problem. He wanted to fix the person. So he could have threatened him. He said, Sonny, next time you do that, guess what? I'm shooting you. <laughs> right? I mean, he could have threatened him. He could have, but he, Pro solve the problem, fix the problem, fix the person by being kind. By being kind. And who would have thought of that? I wouldn't have thought of that. I would have thought, well, let's give him a, 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 a yeah, <laughs> let's give him a switching. <laughs> I, I, instead of giving him a six pack of cold pop, you know, I wouldn't have thought of that. But here, look at the impact that it had on this, on this person. Another story um, is about it, the judge's wife. Um, <clears throat> there was a judge once who really had a, who was really hard on criminals. Um, I, I think we need more judges like that these days. He developed a reputation for giving out the maximum sentence. He was feared by some and hated by many, especially major crime figures. Eventually, a person was hired to assassinate the judge. The, the assassin stalked the judge for several days, planning the right moment, and that moment arrived and the judge was shot and killed in front of his house. Eventually, the assassin was caught and sentenced to life in prison. Uh, the judge's wife was really bitter and angry w about this sentence. She felt that he should have received the death penalty, and I think I would agree with her. You know, the death penalty is biblical. <laughs> she finally came to the conclusion, and, and for a long time she held bitterness um, in her heart, and resentment in her heart, but she finally came to the conclusion that the, that the bitterness and resentment um, were only hurting her and no one else. It wasn't doing a thing to the other person. Um, and so she decided to change, change, try to change this. She needed to forgive the assassin. She started to send him uh, cookies and things in prison, and no, they weren't laced with poison. 
<clears throat> One day, she decided to visit him in prison. She brought him a Bible. The assassin was just overwhelmed by her kindness. He couldn't understand why is she being so kind to the man that murdered her husband. He asked her for an explanation. And she shared with him how Christ took the anger out of her heart and brought her peace. He was so surprised at her attitude that he started to read the Bible she brought him. And today, this man has dedicated his life to helping others in prison find God. So there's another example of overcoming evil with kindness. Now I'd like to share with you my own story. And no, that, that's not me. I'm a lot, I'm a lot cuter. <laughs> when I was about, about eight years old, um, and I've never, my parents were not Christians, and so I've never been to church. And, um, and when I was, and back in the days when we used to play outside, anybody know what that is like? You know, play outside? <laughs> yeah, we don't do that anymore. But back in the days when we used to pretty much spend all, all of our free time outside, right? We, we're not in front of a video game or TV. We're, we're outside most of the time. So back in those days, um, I was outside playing with, with my friend. And I forget what happened. You know, this was back when I was eight. Um, this is just five years ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Plus. Um, so uh, something, we had an argument of some kind, and he pushed me down, and I fell down, and then he started running away. Well, I grabbed a rock, and I threw it at him, and I hit him. <laughs> I didn't expect that. I'm not that great of a shot, but I hit him on the head, and I couldn't believe the blood, how much blood came out of that head. I mean, it, it, was, he was, it was just, it was a lot. It scared me, and I started running the other way. I said, oh, no. I might have killed him, you know. Um, and, and so when you're, when you're that young, you don't, you, you don't realize the consequences. But um, so I, uh, the next day, I was just outside playing, and I see him coming towards me, big old bandage <laughs> around his head. And I thought, oh, no, he's going he's gonna to get revenge. Now, now I've had it. OK, I'm ready. <laughs> he comes up to me. And he says, uh, my mom and I would like to invite you to lunch. Would you like to come have lunch with us? And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> All right, so who do you have at your house that's going to gang up on me? You know. <clears throat> and so I said, well, I didn't have anything else to do, sure. So I went over and um, had lunch with them. And the mom was just super nice to me. I thought for sure. She said, why did you throw that rock at my son? <laughs> why did you make him bleed so much? Um, but no, she prepared a really nice lunch for me, for us, and, and she said, you know, um, this Sunday, we're going to church. Would you like to go, go to church with us? And I've never been to church, and I, but I said, yeah, um, I, I'd like to try it just for curiosity. You know, what's church like? Um, so I, I'll ask my mom, see what she says, and my mom said, yeah, yeah, you can go. And that was my first time in church. And so, and you know, it isn't a, it's only in hindsight that we see these things. I didn't know it at that time, but later on I realized what they were doing. They were treating me with kindness that I didn't deserve. And that's what, <clears throat> part of what changed my life. And finally, the last story, potato salad. <laughs> we're almost at lunch, so this my, this will whet your appetite a little bit, okay? <clears throat> The, just uh, last, last week, yeah, I think it was last week, last Friday, we had a potluck at work. And um, my, my colleagues at work, they all know I'm a Seventh-day Adventist because of, um, well, I explained this in my Sabbath school class once, um, uh, because when the sundown goes, um, goes down early, you know, it, um, like about 4.45, uh, I believe. Um, I asked my, I asked the pr Fresno County, that, uh, that's who I work for, I asked them for religious accommodation because um, I have to explain that I work, I don't work from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown because of my belief in keeping God's Sabbath holy. So I had to write this long letter 
you know, explaining my beliefs and things like that. And that, um, so it, during the winter, between November and January, um, when, when the sundown goes down fairly early, like about 4.45, um, I'm, I asked them, can I take just a half hour lunch and get off a half hour early at 4.30 so that I won't be violating uh, my religious principles? And every year, they've always accommodated me. They've always said, yeah, that, you know, that's fine. You're, not, you're still working the same hours. And, and you're not hurting us, you know, and so they agree with that. But then my, my colleagues would wonder, well, hey, Dave, how come you leave leaving early? And then I have to explain to them, well, you know, um, because of the sundown, blah, 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 blah. So they, <clears throat> they know uh, that I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And so when we had potluck, oh, and they also, sometimes they would, I would tell them, they would bring, um, like, ham and, and um, pastrami. Um, anyway, they would bring stuff, and I say, well, um, I don't eat pork. And so, oh, so Seventh-day Adventists don't eat pork? No, we, you know, we follow these health guidelines and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and so during the potluck, um, a colleague of mine who sits right next to me, um, I'm, I'm her trainer, and um, we, when she's kind of my, my desk mate, you know, because she sits right next to me. And so she's learned more about me than probably every, <laughs> everyone else has. Um, and we, during the potluck, she says, you know, I'm going to get my sister-in-law to make us some potato salad. She makes the best potato salad ever. And, um, and I say, wow, that's great, you know. Um, however, her best potato salad included bacon bits, okay, as you see. And, and I was surprised that when, when she brought the potato salad to work, she says, um, well, here's the potato salad. But my sister-in-law made a special batch just for you with no bacon bits. <laughs> you know. and, uh, and I thought, wow, how considerate. I mean, she didn't have to do that. I could have just taken off the bacon bits. you know. Um, and I thought, how, how considerate of her to, to even think about me. And so she must have told her sister-in-law that I was a Seventh-day Adventist. See how these things grow little by little? Um, and so I decided, I think the Lord impressed me to do something I, I normally wouldn't have done. You know, men don't do, um, think about being thankful. Um, but I said, I decided, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to buy her a can of almond roca and, and put a little thank you note for going out of her way to make me a special batch of potato salad. And just something nice like that. It was over the weekend, so that, um, I was able to buy the uh, can of almond roca and bring it to her the next day. Uh, just a little thank you. And that's what it means to be a steward of God's reputation. She knows I'm an Adventist. And, she's, and she, you know, hopefully she'll think, well, that was, that was kind of him to even re recognize that I you know, went, did something for him. And in this case, it was easy because it was showing kindness for kindness, right? That, that was easy. But when we show kindness to those who hurt us, that's when the spirit can make the biggest impact on a person's heart. And that's what being a steward of God's reputation is all about. So we need to be, as Christians, we need to be on the lookout for situations where we can show undeserved kindness, especially to someone who hurts us. Okay? Those, we're not, we need to be looking out for it. It's not going to always pop up. We're gonna, we need to be looking out. Well, you know, here's a situation where someone has, did so, has done something bad to me, and um, maybe, maybe I can show some undeserved kindness here. Be on the lookout for those situations. Um, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I love this cartoon. Here's this little mouse offering his cookie to the cat, and maybe saying, you know, eat this cookie instead of me. Um, <clears throat> overcoming overcoming um, evil with good. I thought, I thought that was a really cute, cute little um, cartoon. And then finally, this, this text. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. And that's, what, that's, the, life, that's the kind of life that we need to live. Um, and it's, it's not giving Bible studies. It's not teaching uh, or doing something big like that. 
It's doing the little things in our lives, little things where people can see that um, we're not like the world. Keeping your promises. You know, you make a promise, you keep it. Amen. Little things like that. Um, just showing kindnesses that, uh, to people that, that may not deserve it. You know, and forgiving people that <laughs> may not deserve it. Um, look, just little things like that. That's what it means to be a steward of God's reputation. And um, when, when, see, when people see that in our lives each day, the things that we say, the things that we do, um, then hopefully they will look at us and they will glorify God. Amen. And that's Amen. the whole purpose. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we ask that you will make us better stewards of your reputation, that the things we do each day, the things we say each day, will bring glory and honor to your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.